Good evening, everyone. If I could have uh, your attention. Thank you all for coming. It's so lovely to see you all today for today's event. There's a couple of housekeeping before we start. Um, first of all, my name's Natasha and I'll be chairing the event and I'll be introducing our guest speakers for you today. Uh, I am not necessarily a career shifter, but I did start my legal career as a mature student. Um, I uh, qualified as a solicitor in 2007. Uh, I worked in East London. I now have my own practice in Peterborough. We are going to hear today from six guest speakers. They're going to speak for about 10 minutes each. Uh, after all our guests have spoken, we'll give you an opportunity to answer questions. So just raise your hand, don't be shy, we won't bite. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker, speaker sorry, Kate. Kate is a criminal law barrister based at Rose Court Chambers, uh, and she started her career as a prison officer at HMP Holloway and HMP Pentonville. Kate. So one of the first things I wrote down was run immediately if fire alarm goes off. <laughs> <laughs> one of the first things you learn if uh, you do pursue a career as a barrister is to always follow the judge's directions. Um, the judge has said, don't run, and I've written down, run immediately. So that bodes well for me going forward. Um, don't follow my instructions, follow the judge's instructions. Um, so I'm Kate, I am 31 years old. I um, decided very early on in my undergraduate degree that I wanted to be a barrister, um, but it wasn't happening for me. So I decided to go off and work. I do crime, um, practice crime, not commit crime. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the lines are blurred. That is not true. It, they are not blurred. Um, I'm nervous. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I decided to go work in prison. Um, I wanted to see firstly whether I can actually handle people that uh, appear in criminal courts, whether I can communicate them with them effectively. And um, I wanted to see if I can help somebody. Uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to be a barrister. I'm an underdog fighter. I fight for defendants. Um, I don't prosecute, although I have um, in the past because I was forced to. Um, not with a gun to my head, but with the pressures of the clerking system, which again, if you become barristers, you will learn about that pressure. Um, my career as a prison officer was probably one of the hardest things to do. It was the easiest job I ever got, but it was the hardest job I ever had. Um, I worked on the mental health wing in Holloway with women that suffered from severe several different and serious mental health conditions and then Holloway closed down in 20, 2016 and I was shipped off to Pentonville where I dealt with category B prisoners. If anyone knows a little bit about that, that's basically any remand prisoner that is not category A prisoner, so the most serious criminals don't really appear in Pentonville. Anyway, anyone else does. So anything from petty thefts to murderers were in Pentonville and I had to deal with day in and day out. Um, I thought it was probably the best things I ever did in terms of progressing my career. And I found that some um, chambers viewed that as a negative um, because it's not, I was once told, a highly skilled job. And I went on to say, you are absolutely ridiculous. It is one of the most skilled jobs out there. Um, and it was a lot of learning curves it, it, for me personally, um, particularly um, being young and female in a male prison environment was a bit of a challenge. But it's given me invaluable, invaluable experience in terms of communicating with my clients now. And also I can, I'm able to assist them in prison, in terms of prison life, you know, I can assist them if they are going to be sentenced on what to do, what not to do, um, who, who they can ask for assistance if they need it, who the best persons are to contact in prison. And occasionally I have assisted judges with the same information. Um, if I hadn't done my job prior to coming to the bar, I wouldn't have been able to do any of those things. 
So that is a little bit of the history uh, about me. If I, if you, if you are interested in day-to-day -day life as a barrister, I can give you a bit more information about that. It wasn't an easy journey, I'm not going to lie, um, but I think, and one of the reasons I was so excited about this event is because it doesn't matter what your career paths are. It just doesn't matter. As long as you have the perseverance to come to the bar, do it. Do it, do it, do it. It's it's genuinely one of the best jobs. One of the most rewarding jobs is the legal profession. Uh, and you're gonna hear uh, from various different people with different areas of law uh, and everything. I always try to encourage people to do crime. Sorry guys, um, because it is just so, so important that we have people from all different walks of life uh, coming into the legal profession uh, and i think sometimes there's a perception that um, barristers are from particular background particular race particular gender and that's just no, no longer true um, and we want to encourage people from any role any job if you've made a decision to, to come into the legal profession do it do it with your guts uh, and don't be afraid of where you come from Thank you, Kate. Um, that was really insightful because what I got from that is that through Kate's experience working in the prisons, it gave her a transferable skill uh, because she worked with people and working within the legal profession, whatever area of law, <coughs> um, that is a skill that you could move with you as a career shifter. Our next speaker is Alex. Uh, Alex is a chartered legal executive uh, for a city-based law firm. Um, he qualified in 2021 at the age of 38. Alex, take it away. Right. Good evening all. I'm going to start off with, uh, I feel a sense of uh, validation to be sitting in this company about to share my story. My narrative will be slightly different, although there may be some overlap with my esteemed colleague over there, Victoria, given it took us, you know, the time it took us to qualify. Uh, I have not come into law from a different profession. And what I want to showcase is that if you are committed and proactive and have a sprinkling of luck and good fortune, the road to qualifying can be reached regardless of your age. My journey started back in 2002 and it took me 19 years to qualify. I took what was perceived as the traditional route back then, and had taken a law degree followed by the LPC. For reasons I'm happy to share later on, I did not complete all of the LPC modules. As a result, I was left in career limbo and debt from the postgraduate loan. A few months after the LPC term finished in 2006, I started my legal career and have been in private practice ever since. I've only had a few roles in my 17 years in practice, but I've been fortunate that these have covered different areas of law, such as professional negligence, insurance, personal injury, and currently property litigation. It was not until the early 2010s that I discovered the, the Silex route. I did at first try distance learning via Silex, but found that I needed a, a regime. And so it was not until 2015 that I put the rules into motion to set about qualifying as a fellow by undertaking the graduate fast track scheme at the University of Westminster. I think looking back, two things were holding me back at that stage. One was the financial commitment, and the second, the commitment to attend on set days, despite what may be going on with work and family. I mentioned earlier about a sprinkling of luck. After drafting a proposal, a senior partner at my last firm agreed to sponsor my studies also allowed me to allocate some time during the working week to dedicate to more studying. What it did mean, however, was that I was hitting the books in and around work and also studying on the weekends. It was not easy to balance work and studies, and it certainly is not even more difficult to balance everything when you have a family. At this point in time, I'm currently making an application to cross back over to my original route and qualify as a solicitor. This will be undertaken via what's called the equivalent means route, which focuses on experience rather than academics. After that, it will be my higher rights and eventually I want to sit on the judiciary. I put my cards on the table, things that could have and should have gone differently. I was not given the best career advice when starting out. For example, I perhaps should have been forewarned at the age of 22 that one should think long and hard about completing the LPC without a guarantee of a training contract. 
But that if you decide that you want to proceed, then it should really be encouraged to complete the, the diploma. Also, if I had qualified via Silex much earlier in my career, I would not have needed to complete the extensive and exhausting work-based learning portfolio. With that said, I am now looking to capitalise on all that has gone on before and channel that into qualifying as a solicitor. Opportunities are now more abound than they previously were. There was no reduction to a training contract. And there was certainly no equivalent means route. One must really take advantage of these options. The question may be asked about why I didn't qualify sooner. After the LPC, I moved back to Wales and found it difficult to travel back and forth to London for the outstanding LPC modules. Three years passed and I was time barred from completing the LPC. I suppose there was an element also of imposter syndrome and that even if I had made it via Silex sooner, Silex was not viewed back then in the same way as the SRA and that qualifying without a training contract was not the same as two years of qualifying work experience. As I said, this is of course changing with the advent of the SQE. And finally, there was an element of complacency back then, just rolling with the punches. And there is a the plan. Some things, something always comes off and one day becomes one week, one week becomes one year, and then it becomes 19 years. So in 2015, I, re I finally reached a point where I realised being a Fianna without the title was only viable for so long and that pathways would be opened on qualification. I'd like to share some of my, my top tips. Hopefully you can, you can take something on board. Aim high but aim realistically. The goalposts shift as you get older and what you once considered to be your ideal setting may learn, no longer be. Identify the law area of law you want to specialise in and dip your toe in by getting experience. If doors do not open, build your own. Do not underestimate the value of a good support system, be it family, friends, employers. Understand that your life skills are transferable skills and will only enhance your appeal. Remember that you have something different to offer than the current crop of graduates. Your degree is theory, your LPC is practice, but I tell you, actual work in the legal profession is a totally different ballgame. You are not taught how to tender bids for clients, how to manage a caseload effectively, and how to record time to ensure you are meeting your all important billables. Try and pick up, pick up these skills if you can. Finally, you are your own brand, so remember the importance of marketing. I hope this brief snapshot into my journey will provide you with some steer direction and acumen needed for you to fulfil yours. Looking forward to speaking with you both at Drinks and Nipples. Thanks, Alex. How amazing is that? Um, Alex is showing us that it's never too late to qualify uh, within the legal uh, profession, but you do need a sprinkle of determination, right? And that's, you've got to dig deep. It's not easy. Um, that's brilliant. Thanks for those tips as well, Alex. I can definitely relate to some of those. Our next speaker is Christian. Christian left school at the age of 17 with four O-levels, showing his age there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he's our farmer boy. Um, he is a career shifter uh, from a farmer to lawyer. Uh, he started his law degree at Burbeck in 2014. Take it away, Christian. Thank you very much. I was about to say... Um... <laughs> I wouldn't bother, you haven't heard what I've got to say. <laughs> um, I will very briefly tell you about me because uh, I bore myself with it and so I'll definitely be boring you and then I'll give you some, uh, carry on where Alex left off and give you some tips about how to get into law if I can. Um, yes, I did leave school at 17. Um, in those days you could leave school at 16 if you wanted. I hung around for an extra year and achieved absolutely nothing. Um, and I, I um, I was actually on lunch break one day and wandered into town <clears throat> in Cambridge and saw an Army Careers Office and laughed because I didn't want to go in the Army, I wanted to go in the Royal Air Force and walked into the RAF Careers Office and said, can I join the RAF? And they said, well, what are you doing with your education? And I said, well, I just finished my O-levels and I got four and they laughed. So I walked out and walked straight into the Army Careers Office and said, any chance I can join the Army? And they said, um, are you breathing? <laughs> and I said, yes. And they said, can you spell your own name? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And they said, good, you're in. That was it. So I, I joined the army and left school. My mother wasn't very impressed. And um, 
I then decided to stop doing that <clears throat> after the Gulf War. Thought, thought that was probably enough. Um, and went uh, just by accident, just slipped into farming. I had no plan whatsoever of what I wanted to do. Did that for a while, <clears throat> managed to con a bank into lending me quite a lot of money to buy my own cows and ended up with 250 dairy cows, contract farming in Wiltshire, on an organic farm. I did that for quite a long time and then um, the contract came up and I couldn't find anywhere else to go and couldn't really afford to move because money was quite tight. And so sold up, um, made a loss on the sale, which I've only just finished paying for, and um, decided to actually have a plan and think about what I was going to do next. And I'd always had an interest in law. I'd worked in the magistrate's court uh, when I was young. Um, in fact, the, um, the reason I worked in the magistrate's court, which I don't share with very many people, is because I'd actually been in front of the magistrates and been given a fine for something which I won't go into now. <clears throat> but uh, So not only can you become a barrister if you've got no qualifications, but you can also do it if you've got a criminal record. <laughs> uh, so I, yes, I decided that I would have a look at getting into law, because that's what I wanted to do. And I'd always wanted to be a barrister because I remember as a boy sitting uh, in court um, in between when I was filing for the, for the magistrates or for the Mark, anyway, I used to do all the filing um, in my spare time. And I remember seeing these people come in with their wigs and their gowns on and everybody would sort of defer to them a bit. And they seemed to know what they were talking about. I now realise they don't, but that's, that's, <laughs> they seemed to know what they're talking about. And they look great. So I thought, yes, I wanted to do that. And law is, um, for me, one of those subjects that's very interesting because it combines English, which I enjoy, and history, which I enjoy. They were the only two O-levels I really got. Maths was on a retake and the other one was also English. Um, and so I decided to try and do a law degree just for myself really to start with and then see if I could get into law um, and managed to do that. Um, I was working full time. I managed to get a job working for a property management company, which was very useful as it turned out. Uh, did a law degree in the evenings, used to walk over to Birkbeck and then managed to get um, on a part time bar course at Gray's Inn at um, City University. Did that for two years and then somehow managed to get pupillage, I'm not really sure how. So that's really my uh, story. I now practice in um, property, contract, uh, law, all that sort of thing. Um, I have no interest in representing underdogs whatsoever. I just want to pay the mortgage, frankly. So I um, <laughs> highly, highly recommend civil law to anybody who wants to do that. Um, one of my um, friends who, who is a criminal barrister said to me the other day, the irony of, of you people, mainly civil barristers, is you can actually afford the wig and gown even though you never use it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, anyway, so yes, I um, highly recommend civil law and being a civil law barrister to anybody who, who likes doing um, law that involves quite a lot of um, history and law. Yeah, we actually do law, <laughs> by the way, yeah, unlike family and uh, criminal. Crime. No, no law at all. So if you, if you want to do law, then... <laughs> Uh, come over to us. Yeah, come over to us. So top tips. First one, um, never look further than the first hurdle, because if you look at the path ahead, apart from the fact when you get to my age, you can't see further than the first hurdle anyway without very focals. <laughs> if, you get, if, you, if you look too far ahead, you'll just, you just won't do it. I mean, I, I couldn't really see how I was going to finish my degree while I was working, um, particularly as my wife very selfishly decided to have a baby during the middle of my degree. <laughs> I then couldn't really see how I was going to afford to do the bar course, which I couldn't, but somehow managed to steal money, borrow money, beg from things and don't know what. Um, and my wife very selfishly decided to have a baby while I was doing my final exams for my bar. And then I didn't really see how I was going to get pupillage because nobody wants an old fossil uh, who's you know, failed at various other careers. Um, and I did get pupillage. My wife very, very selfishly decided to have a baby <laughs> during the course of my pupillage, um, which was uh, unfortunate. Um, and um, so, yeah, look one, look at one hurdle at a time, get to that point, do that hurdle, then think, oh, okay, manage that one, what's next, and do the next one. Uh, don't listen to naysayers. I spoke to quite a lot of barristers, some of them very senior, who all said to me, now you're wasting your time, you're far too old, you just never make it, it won't happen. Um, don't listen to them. You can go to Cambridge, was the other one, Rob. So, yeah. don't, don't listen to those people. Don't worry about the money. 
uh, which is a very odd thing to say because it's all very expensive to do. You have to pay for a lot of this stuff, particularly if you want to become a barrister and get to the bar. Um, but a very, very old and very, very wise dairy farmer I used to know when I started farming said to me, make a plan, start to follow the plan, forget the money. The money, if you need money, the money is the easy part. There's always somebody that will lend you money. There's somewhere you can go to, to get uh, grants, to get scholarships. There are all sorts of, I mean, that's, everybody thinks that's the hard bit. In some ways that can be the, the hard bit is doing the study. The hard bit is finding the time and the commitment to the study, is persistently pursuing pupillage if you want to get pupillage. That's the hard bit. The rest of it you kind of make up as you go along. And I, I, I took that advice. I thought it was nonsense when I took it, but actually it turned out to be right. I mean, I didn't have any money to do any of these things and somehow I managed to get student loans, get um, scholarships, get bits of grant money here and there and all the rest of it. Um, and actually managed to do it. Um, if you do decide to become a barrister and apply for pupillage, don't listen to all the nonsense they tell you when you go to law school <coughs> about how you, you know, look around and decide which set fits in with your objectives. No, don't do that. You apply everywhere. <laughs> you shower this town and any other town you can find that has barristers in it with your application. It has to be a good application. You can't do 30 applications and not have them good. I think I did 34. I think I did applied in two years. The first year was 26, and the second year was 34. I thought more was, but definitely more. Um, definitely apply outside London. Everybody wants to come to places like this. Garden Court, everybody will apply. They'll have hundreds. Don't bother. <coughs> <laughs> come to places like Canterbury, where we don't get as many applications. You know, because um, it's it's you know it's just as good. Get pupillage anywhere. It doesn't matter where. Okay, apply everywhere. Do a pupillage you don't want to do. Do a family pupillage if you don't want to do family. Do a civil one if you don't want to do civil. It doesn't matter. Get pupillage because it's a lot easier when you've had pupillage and you become a tenant to then say, okay, over the next two years, I'm now going to try and become a criminal barrister. I'm going to try and become a civil barrister and move across from one side to the other. We had have somebody joining us very soon who has been a criminal barrister for about three or four years and has decided he doesn't want to do that anymore. He wants to. Um, come over to 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 do civil, and um, you know we're going to convert him over quite quite easily. So we need more civil barristers. So I suppose those are my tips. I've probably talked for far too long. Um, if I'd realised this was going to be on YouTube, I'd have put on some makeup. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christian. So um, I hope you're encouraged by Christian's story. You're never too old uh, to get into the legal uh, profession and you can change careers wherever you're coming from. Um, there's nothing stopping you, even if you've committed a criminal offence, apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, you do need to have a plan, have a structure, but take one step at a time towards your journey and eventually uh, like all of us, you will get there. Uh, so uh, that brings me on to our next speaker, uh, Victoria, uh, is uh, a partner and head of an immigration city law firm in Clinton. Um, she has a very colourful story. She was homeless in her teens. Uh, she uh, had a role as an, a, a junior administrator. Uh, and was also an amateur boxer. Uh, so I hope you find her journey uh, interesting. Thank you, Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. Well, that's all true. Um, I think I would probably start my story a little bit earlier than most of my brilliant colleagues up here. Um, life throws hurdles at all of us. And there are, you know, sometimes things really just take you off the tracks and it's not in your control. And I think the message that I would hope that um, I would be able to convey in the next 10 minutes or less maybe, um, is don't worry too much if you've had something really odd happen, maybe a bit traumatic, because actually it shapes who you are and it shapes how you deal with 
everything and who you are with your team and who you are with your colleagues and how you approach your clients and all of that is really really important so yeah um things went wrong for my dad very very badly wrong and we ended up living in a tent it was not nice it was very traumatic it was extremely stressful it was not for very long about a month um but it's not something that ever leaves you not gonna lie it's still something that is very much part of my character today um that triggered uh, a series of quite bad autoimmune illnesses and i didn't do very well at a levels as a result um i think by the time i was doing a levels i had the illness i'd come out of homelessness and i was just done i was so tired so no i didn't do very well at a levels i was tired at the end of it living you know supporting myself through the whole thing which you know is, is tough at the best of times so already having that life of working and studying already and i remember going to an oxbridge um thing and it was the year when so i had i'd had to redo my second year available and that meant i fell into the first year um when they introduced uh, they got rid of grants or something for universities so labor did that and i looked at it and i, li I remember listening to all these people at oxbridge and thinking, oh my god there's no way i'm going to fit in with these people you know, I'm going to be there, I'm going to be working a full time job, trying to get a degree and being around all these people who are, you know, high achievers, I'm, I'm just not going to fit in. So I had massive imposter syndrome, my confidence was very badly knocked. And I just went into the world of work. Um, I started out in a watch shop on Bond Street, which is quite fun, met some really famous people, that's really fun. Um, <laughs> just ambled about doing admin work, really didn't have direction. I was in a courier firm actually, whilst I was doing my A-levels, um, ended up at City Sprint, some of you might know City Sprint, uh, then went to the watch shop, um, got fired, because I really wasn't loving it. Um, and then I fell into a junior secretarial job in a sole practitioner's law firm in Mayfair. And I remember my interview with John and he, um, didn't ask me a thing about my experience and we just talked about random stuff and I thought oh god I'm never going to get that but I did um and it was the start of a big big shift in my life and I realized I really like this this is really interesting and John supported me a lot and he helped me do a couple of silex courses for secretarial work um at the same time I found um I found boxing I'd always enjoyed it but I found myself um, in a gym where uh, there was a coach who was willing to take me on as an ABA boxer, which was super fun. And at the time, there weren't very many girls doing boxing. <laughs> so my life for the next sort of five years or so was boxing and secretarial in law. Um, I found myself at a city firm called uh, Oldswang. Uh, some of you might have heard of it, um, pre-merger. And I had a very bad boxing injury and I couldn't I couldn't fight anymore um and that was when i took a cold hard look at what my life was and i thought oh no i don't like this i think i think i can do better and i think it's only so far that um you can take yourself and and realize no no this 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 has a finite end i i, I want more for myself than this so my confidence has started to build a bit and i think when you're in a boxing ring that can help with a bit of self-confidence as well so I decided to um, pluck up a bit of courage and I applied to Birkbeck with virtually, you know, nothing academic to really count for. And I was accepted. And it was the start of one hell of a journey. Um, I won a law prize in my first year. I got firsts across all my subjects. And I still remember the feeling of going, oh my God, I might actually be able to do this. And I really didn't think I'd get past the first year, if I'm honest. Um, and that's when I thought, oh, academically, I might actually have something to offer. I wasn't very well in my second year. I had to take a year out, but uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the details of that. But um, I, I finished my degree. I got a first, um, which I'm still really happy about. Um, I don't judge anyone else on their, on their grade, but that's mine, and I'm really proud of it, and I'm going to own that. Um, and then, yes, I went on to do my LPC. Um, whilst i was doing my degree of course i'm working that's what pretty much all of us have done up here um, i was working full time i found myself in an immigration firm at that point and was made paralegal so whilst also doing the academic journey i was also 
working on the professional journey and gaining all those skills that Alex talked about and also Christian as you're progressing through. So actually in a way that that helps because you've got an, a whole load of extra strings to your bow when you're coming out of that degree that a lot of other people will not have. You know, um, by the time I graduated, I was looking after a, a book of sort of 30 or 40 corporate clients on my own. I was, I was kind of doing the law thing anyway, really. Um, went on to do the LPC. I got a lot of support from my firm. I got a training contract and things have been a little bit easier since then. Um, so yeah, I'm now a partner. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm a partner in a, in a city law firm and I'm just about to head up the immigration department, starting it from scratch. They don't have an immigration department yet, but all of the experiences from being homeless to boxing, to being a paralegal, to all of the other admin stuff that I did. And despite being told once that no one is gonna accept you as a solicitor because you're a PA, yeah. Despite that, actually, it's been my biggest strength. And that is now what I'm using to set up a new practice in this law firm. And I'm so unbelievably happy with it. Don't ever think that something you've experienced is going to be a negative. Own it. Be it. It's you. It's who you are. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Victoria. Um, I, I think from from that I get yes you can yes yeah. you can um, it, it, it doesn't matter what your background is um, it doesn't matter where you're coming from um, and I think certainly with law your life experiences your previous work history these are things that you can again transferable skills that you can bring into the legal profession and if any of you think oh well I don't know if I'm smart enough to, to do law. You don't have to be a high achiever. Most of us, I think, didn't leave school with great grades, but you learn your trade. And if you love what you do and you love the law, um, as Victoria has demonstrated, you can come out with a first, yeah? Uh, so thank you very much. That was um, really, really inspiring. Uh, turning on then uh, to our next speaker, Mr. Anthony Graham. Uh, Anthony uh, was uh, a managing director at Amusu Robinshaw Solicitors for 15 years uh, and he's now shifted to become a consultant solicitor. Um, he is on a number of panels that assists lawyers behind the scenes, things that you wouldn't necessarily see. Uh, uh, in relation to the administration of justice for lawyers uh, and from a personal point of view uh, he's also been a really great mentor uh, for me when I've had uh, some questions running my own law firm so take it away Anthony Good evening everybody um, and thanks for the invitation it's really great to be here uh, I've come to Garden Court previously under different circumstances and instructing barristers in a former life, kind of former life as a criminal defence solicitor, not barrister. Um, I wasn't aware we'd we'll be doing a background thing actually, um, so I'm going to do that very, very briefly in terms of my background. Um, I wanted to say, Natasha, that I buck the trend and say that I came up with great grades from school. Um, actually, I didn't. Um, <laughs> um, I school with one GCSE actually, um, much to my parents' displeasure at the time, as you can imagine. Um, but again, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger uh, and you go through your journey and you learn different things along the way. So fast track the in between. I ended up at university and I did the traditional route actually. I did a straight law degree. I did that uh, over 30 years ago, started that degree, uh, which was good. It was a tough journey to get to uni, um, but got there eventually and did a master's degree in criminal justice, uh, not too far from here around the corner, uh, which was good, which was a great degree. Uh, and I worked as a housing officer for a couple of years, uh, which was uh, a real insight into how life was um, at the coalface for individuals that were vulnerable. And that sort of set the trend from my perspective in regards to um, like what Kate says, um, you know, fighting for the underdog, as it were. Um, I didn't have a terribly difficult upbringing, quite frankly, I don't have that story to tell. And when I speak in schools, sometimes people 
expect the story. Actually, I didn't. It was quite normal, if whatever normal is. Um, and um, I still felt that there were people, particularly from my role as a housing officer, uh, that needed help. And sometimes you just need to push. Sometimes you need to push and push some more. Uh, and then you'll, you know, you'll achieve what you need to achieve. And that's what some of my clients did. Uh, the applicants who were applying for housing, some applicants just would not give up. You would get a member's inquiry from the MP, a councillor's inquiry, and they just would not give up. And it, you know, it begged a question to myself that actually, okay, I do wish to become a lawyer, but I just need to keep pushing. Eventually I did so, and I took a relatively unconventional route in relation to a training contract in that I did complete a training contract in a local authority. That's where I did, that's where I did my training. And I first went into Bexley Council as a highways assistant. Um, so from having aspirations of being the next um, Blair Underwood, I don't know anybody used to watch LA Law back in the old days. Um, yeah, showing my age a bit. I, I went to work in the highways department of a legal department uh, in a local authority. But it was, it was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Good training. Managed to secure a training contract in the local authority. And if anybody works for the local authority now, I don't know if anybody here does work for a council. Um, it is it's great training, great training. Because um, I dipped my feet into some contract work, into planning work, into housing work, into childcare and prosecutions. And I was on my feet as an advocate um, in my training contract because you could present cases in the magistrate's court uh, as a trainee. So that was great experience, but something within me felt that I needed to do criminal defence, so that's what I embarked upon. So I went to work for a firm in um, in the city, then I left there after a short period of time uh, and went to my old firm, as it were, 20 years ago. I was their first employee, uh, and then it came to a point where we grew, became a partner, one of the founding partners left, I then took over, and I was the managing partner of that firm, criminal defence firm, Quite a busy firm, very high profile cases, and I did that for quite some time uh, up until this year where I decided to make the change for lifestyle choices. Uh, and I think I've done my time in the trenches in regards to um, running a firm. Um, it, it's quite challenging to say the least, um, particularly, I'm sure, you know, Mark's here, uh, Katie here will testify to the difficulties that you have with the legal aid agency. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and, and the court system and so on and so forth. But again, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And, it, and it's been a great experience and I absolutely advocate um, anybody coming into uh, the, the profession, particularly if you are coming into that particular arm of the profession to stick with it because you will see the results eventually. Um, but Moreover, this evening, I wanted to speak from the perspective of, a, of an employer because I was an employer. Uh, I employed lots of members of staff and I employed uh, individuals from all walks of life. I'm proud to say that I um, supported various individuals from numerous different backgrounds. Somebody that came from the city, he was a city banker, somebody that was a hairdresser, somebody that came uh, to England as uh, an asylum seeker and was working a variety of different jobs. Uh, somebody that came in and I can't remember what the other person did, but there were just so many people that came from a variety of different backgrounds and it just did not deter them. In fact, we embraced it uh, as a firm because uh, we were relatively unconventional. We were not stuffy. Um, you know, 20 years ago, it wasn't the thing to come to court, uh, come to, um, to work, not wearing a suit, but I turned up for my interview in my suit and I said, you can take that off for a start because we're not having any of that in here. Uh, and it didn't diminish the quality of work. It just meant that I was suitably motivated and supported to, to work to the point where I enjoyed working on the evening. In the evening, I enjoyed working on the weekend. It's kind of par for the course in criminal defence, but it, it made it more palatable. It made it more easier because you needed to be inclusive. And as a, as a firm, that's what we were. So you're all here because you're all interested potentially of um, entering into uh, the legal profession mid-career. And as um, my fellow esteemed um, panelists alluded to, transferable skills is what you can bring to the table. Um, I, I cannot emphasize the importance of transferable skills because what that essentially means is that you can hit the ground running. So you speak to an employer and you give them a history of your, uh, of your background and what you've done and so on and so forth and straight away, that employer can say, okay, I can see that she has done this, he has done that. That would be good for, um, for, for certain types of clients, whether or not it's family, 
um, commercial clients. It doesn't really matter. It could be the whole spectrum of services, legal services. Um, it's very, very good that you have those um, transferable skills. Um, and arguably, um, and I don't wish to be too controversial, but when you have um, life skills and you're a bit more mature in your career, put it that way, I'd like to believe that you're a bit more resilient to the challenges um, that face uh, us as those who have worked um, in different careers. So it's not the case where you're, you're, you're shot when 5.31 p.m. comes and a brief comes and you need to fix it. You know, you, you can get on with it because you've handled challenges uh, over the years. But on the flip side of that, I have to say, you have to be prepared um, to adjust to work conformity as well. So there may be some of you here who are leaders in your own right. There may be some of you who uh, are in charge of your own designated station and section and so on and so forth. And you may well go into an organization, a law firm, uh, and you could say, oh, I could, I could fix that and just change this around a bit. You, you, you can't because guess what? These systems have been in place for quite some time mm -hmm. and they work. And you just have to accept that. If you are moving from one career to another, you have to accept that you just can't come in and sort of change things straight away. And it may be the case that your potential employer will be receptive to any views or any um, suggestions that you may have, because I, I have, um, you know, and they may well be, but there are systems in place for a particular reason, and you just have to accept that as well. And this is the other side of um, sometimes employing graduates. They're easier to mold uh, because some graduates don't have any previous experience, but at the same time, without a shadow of a doubt. I'd always prefer, if I can say that, um, somebody who does have some life experience. Um, build trust, that's another thing that I've, I've mentioned here. Um, build trust, build the relationship. Um, a lot of you, I'm sure, will have experience of building relationships in your current employment. Whether or not it's law, it's academic. Whether or not you're going into uh, the building trade or you, you, you want to be, into the medical profession, you need to build relationships. So when you engage with your new firm, because I'm that confident that you will get that far, when you engage with your new firm, build that relationship, take the time to build the relationship. And whilst some individuals may well be in a hurry to get to where they are going, it doesn't matter because age really is a number. You know, it, it's, it's just so academic. You just need to take the time to build that relationship. And I'm sure that you will be able to look back and absorb all the information and all what's happening around you uh, to make an assessment much quicker than somebody with less experience can. Um, and Alex mentioned the fact that um, you are your own brand. You need to appreciate that you are a business within a business. Law firms are businesses and you need to sell. You need to market. And this is something that I was a taught in law school. And it's, a, it's an absolute travesty. But I don't know whether or not it's changed um, because I know there is now the SQE route that some individuals are taking. And if anybody wants to speak to me about the SQE, they can a bit later. Um, but when I was in law school, it was an absolute travesty that they did not teach you the fact that you are working for a business. So, you know, I entered the profession, the profession and a firm very, very green. And even though I trained in a local authority, when I went to work for a law firm, I didn't fully grasp at first the importance of selling. You need to sell. You need to sell. You need to sell your, 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 your skills. And you need to be good at what you do. Um, and it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter where you're from. I mean, the whole spectrum of, um, of individuals can have a good client base. And that's one thing I really love about the legal profession. It absolutely doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what your background is. If you're good and people know you, your reputation will precede you and you will build your practice. But you are working in a business. So if you could just absorb and um, accept that you are, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, and I think it's an entrepreneur, the business within the business. Again, you'll hit the ground running. Um, very briefly, in terms of mid-career, um, I'm also equally somebody who is um, mid-career and, and recently changed over and as I was operating my business and practicing as a defense solicitor, I decided that it was time to make a change myself because uh, something within the spirit, or particularly my spirit, said it was time to do something else. But it was time to do something else within the profession. So I decided to embark upon um, a 
course of study which mm -hmm. would enable me to become a public official, a uh, certified official, which is called a notary public. Some of you may well have come across that um, profession. Um, it's quite a niche profession within the legal profession. Um, and essentially what I do is I assist individuals with various transactions over the world. And I was just speaking to Alice and explaining that if you wanted to buy a property in Spain, you have your Spanish uh, notary and then they would contact me and then you come with your documents and appear in front of me and then you sign your documents in France. If you're purchasing a property, you'll have the French note here. That's my um, terrible uh, attempt at a French accent. Um, but, you know, from a... Uh, from another point of view, I have a lot of um, people in the medical profession who sadly are leaving the NHS. Uh, that's another story within itself, but when they want their qualifications verified to go down under, because typically they're going down under to New Zealand and uh, Australia, they'll come and see me as well. But I, I mention this because I also have to put myself in your shoes. I've had to take my own advice uh, and say to myself, okay, so if I wish to um, work for a firm, um, what skills do I need to bring? Transferable skills. I had to think about that. Um, you know, I had to also try and find myself a mentor. And luckily enough, I did. And I would absolutely advise uh, all of you, if possible, if you can engage with somebody uh, in the legal profession, there are honestly, there are genuine good people in the legal profession that will happily give you advice right find yourself a mentor it is so important to give you the heads up in terms of that particular area of law or just law generally so that worked for me and i found that with my transferable skills irrespective of the fact that i was a lawyer it helps me to develop my practice and to continue to develop my mm -hmm. practice um so all in all i would say the, the legal profession is a fantastic profession it is a great profession I know um, Christian mentioned about um, about finances. I think it is quite important personally. I think Christian's right in that you shouldn't necessarily worry about it. But equally, do your due diligence. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing your due diligence. Things will cost money. Um, so you have to make the decision yourself whether or not it, it's, it, it's financially worth it for you. Eventually, it will be. Uh, but in the same way that you was um, studying for a, you know, another qualification, you just have to do the maths. Uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, but it's a great profession to get into. There are people that will support you. Uh, thank you to Mark again for um, putting on this event this evening. It's essential. Um, and I'm available afterwards for any, you know, any conversations you may wish to have. Merci, Monsieur Graham. Je parle français un peu. I hope you've, uh, Anthony's raised some really interesting points, actually, and I wish I had some of those tips um, when I was first starting out. For every speaker, I've just drawn out some things that I think will hopefully encourage you. You don't have to start your legal training in a law firm. There are other places that have legal departments that can give you really good training. Uh, as Anthony said, local authorities. So don't just think you have to be in a traditional corporate law firm or a high street firm. Um, and uh, as he said, it's important to establish good relationships through your journey. And that is networking, getting to know people. I think certainly for me, it's not necessarily what you know, it's who you know. And if you develop a network of people um, that are able to help, if they can't help, then always find someone else that will be able to help you. So LinkedIn, that kind of thing, um, you know, I think that's a really good tool and a really good piece of advice. Establish good relationships. Uh, you never know when you might need people. Uh, and as well, as Anthony said, uh, surround yourself with people who have positive mindsets. Um, and because you'll, you'll have to develop resilience. There's always going to be someone that's going to say, really, aren't you too old? That's going to take a long time. Uh, no. Um, and last but not least, I, I, I guess another good thing that, that Anthony pointed out that um, a lot of you will be entering into the legal profession as mature students. And unfortunately, you have to remember that you now become the student. You will be told what to do. And it's part of the journey. We've all been there. We've all had to do the photocopying. We've all had to do the, road, the run to the post office. Uh, but these are really important 
integral parts of running a law firm. Um, and I think every cogging that wheel in a law firm or legal environment is important that you understand the business. Uh, because although we all love our jobs, we all love helping people, at the same time, you are running a business and you need to understand how the business works and how important every single person in that business is uh, so that everyone achieves the same goal. Um, so we've come to the, uh, the, the point uh, where I'm going to open up the floor to you lovely people. Um, no question is going to be too small, too big, too silly, just ask it. We're all here to help. And um, uh, so I'm, I'll open up the floor. Uh, and also uh, those watching online, uh, please type in your uh, questions and we will answer them. Try. Oh, lovely. We have a hand up at the back of that lady over there. Hi, um, I'd just like to ask, how do you fit 20 years on two pages? <laughs> uh, 25 years on two pages. Can I answer um, that? Yeah. Um, I'll tell you why I, I wanted to answer that, because I've had to undergo the same exercise recently um, in terms of updating my CV. And I hadn't um, completed a CV for 20 years. Um, and you know, I, I got some advice, funny enough. And this is where network is really good. I'm so lucky that I was in touch with an organization who helped me. Uh, and somebody spoke to me and gave up their time, you know, to, to, to give me some guidance. And what she said to me was, just put the salient points on the first, uh, on the first page. Uh, the headline grabbers just need to go on the first page. All the other bits will, will follow. Uh, you know, so you've got 20 years of experience and it could be a checkered career, but the headline grabbers are what people want to see and everything else they can just talk to you about as of when they want to talk to you about. That was the advice I just received for myself. So I'm part of it, I can't. I think the, uh, what, it's quite an interesting question because quite often on pupillage applications, they put the information in reverse. So they don't start with what you're doing now. I am the King of England, which would be a great headline. They start with the other end of it, which was, I dropped out of school when I was 17 because they want to know what your O-levels or GCSEs were. And as soon as you put in that first column, I got four GCSEs or O-levels, they go, yeah, next. Yeah. Yeah. And so you do have hurdles to overcome with that because quite often the application the forms are the hurdles. I actually asked that is because I just recently, I've bullet pointed most of my CV um, and I recently just got an, a rejection from a pupillage application because although I had pointed out that I was moving to society president, which obviously I would expect to discuss. Um, I didn't say whether I'd won a competition or something like that. Um, and that was the main reason. And so obviously I'm bullet pointing because I've got all these things, but then I'm missing out things that different chambers may want. Um, and then obviously, yeah, I haven't come from a traditional background with loads of GCSEs and no A levels at all. Um, so it's, and then when you apply online on the gateway, um, they will take on into account. But can, can, I, can I suggest something as well? Yeah. Probably, I've, I've done my applications recently and they were absolutely horrific, so I'm sorry that happened to you, but <laughs> there's, there's some chambers that are overly focused on winning and how great your grades are, but there are ones that aren't, so mm -hmm. keep doing it. What I would suggest is, is out of your experience, pick things that um, stand out um, so and, and focus on those things. So, for example, I put on my pupillage application that I used to play the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland um, in, in a theme park uh, in Hearn, um, Orsett. So that's really and truly not, not relevant to law, but it's like, oh, is it? What? Who, why? And then and it piques the reader's interest. And then as, as soon as you've picked the reader's interest, they will read the rest of the form. So pick their interest is, is my top tip. I'd like to reiterate that with the boxing thing, by the way. Oh, by the way, I boxed as well. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why are you coming here? It's a conversation oh. starting. I want to know more about you. Yeah. You're yeah. interesting now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman in the cream. Yeah, thanks. Um, this is a question what led on from yourself, Kate, actually. Um, you was going on about the, you seemed pretty despondent about the pressures of the clerking system. So um, my question is, what is it about the clerking system as opposed to all the other systems that, I suppose, boy, the legal uh, profession that is so, 
<laughs> if that's the I think I hope people will accept this um, and I'm going to be politically correct mm -hmm. with my answer. Mm -hmm. I think clerks can sometimes be over enthusiastic in firstly abilities to travel, <laughs> for example, going from uh, Norwich um, to Guildford in less than two and a half hours. I would say is probably over enthusiastic let's put it that way so I, I make light of it all right it is difficult sometimes to manage expectations because Clark's job is to receive the work you know from solicitors allocate sometimes the work make sure that the listings are correct <laughs> and and everyone can get to every hearing at the right time in the right place and then inform the barristers that, that they have to go to a particular place at a particular time um, they don't, uh, I think, sometimes appreciate that when you are the person in that court, you have to go speak to the prosecutor, you have to go speak to the client, you have to speak to the client's family. And there are things that escalate the times because they just see, right, hearing is at 10, that barrister can get to another hearing for two o'clock. And they don't appreciate that sometimes it just doesn't work. So it, it sounds like you're saying that when you speak to a clerk, maybe allow for an hour in between is the cushion maybe. Totally. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I always tell them, allow an hour extra. Uh, maybe I'm just slow. It could be that. Um, <laughs> ask Mark. Mark will tell you. I mean, without wishing to advocate for suddenly become an advocate for, for clerks around the world. Um, that isn't how our, sets, our chambers operate because we don't do we don't have that fast turnaround criminal work coming in at the last minute and so on. If somebody sent me a set of set of papers at five thirty at night, I'd tell them I'm not doing it. Simple as that. So um, because I wouldn't have time to read it all for a start. Um, uh, not not if I've had a gin and tonic or two. Like <laughs> but, um, so uh, we operate very differently. I I. Um, if I need time to prepare for a hearing, I will block out time in my diary and tell them to block it out for that hearing. If I'm, I do quite a lot of paperwork because I do opinion writing and preparing particular claim and all that stuff, and defences as well. That is also allocated time in the diary. So next week, my week next week is full. I'm actually going to court tour next week. It's, I've got various bits of paperwork to do. So we have a slightly different system. Maybe that's because. Um, we don't do criminal work. Maybe it's because we're out in the countryside where we like to be the, you know, nice and slow and take things at a gentlemanly pace. Um, or maybe it's none of those things and I've just fallen in the butter. The, the, the reason I ask is because of commercialization, because I'm looking at commercial combat as well as the normal bar and um, trying to understand it, seeing from both your different point of views just already, um, it, it, it's clear there's a difference in where you practice. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't mean some of my colleagues don't say, oh my God, they've booked me to be at hearings here and then a hearing there, and it's, I'm never going to make it. I'm not saying that never happens, of course. But um, yeah, we, we have a, uh, it's, it's just, I, I think it's partly to do with the way the work comes in and the kind of work it is as well, I guess. I mean, I'm guessing I don't do criminal rights. So I, I think also as criminal practitioners, we are mostly in court. Um, my paperwork is done at about well today it will be done at 11 o'clock at night when i get home so um that doesn't happen very often and please all come to criminal bar um but no it, it, it tell the truth okay i'm uh, <laughs> thanks mark for giving me permission no we i mean i will be honest at the criminal bar you are working almost 24 7 sometimes especially if you're in trials because you're in court from 10 o'clock till 4 30 then you're traveling home or traveling to court and then you're still working because you have cases in the background that aren't in trial at that moment but still need preparation still need defense statements drafted advices drafted etc et so you are working um at sometimes unsociable hours but it's, it's the way of the downside of, of caring about people. <laughs> a couple of weeks, we have some uh, questions on uh, So the first, uh, one of the questions is, how do you demonstrate your interest um, to a particular set of chambers? Uh, I'll start with, with how I demonstrated my interest in chambers. I googled those chambers and um, found a couple of senior barristers and then googled them um, and found some cases that they had done 
and read those cases if they were court of appeal judgments or even sometimes they're like BBC News man convicted or acquitted of murder and then said I'm very interested in those chambers because that's the kind of work I want to do one day. Um, you have to do your research and you demonstrate the interest through the type of work the chambers is doing so I think knowing what area of law you want to do is, is quite important. There are sets that do mixed um, mixed practice, but um, if you can come with an idea, you have to know what they're going to do. Otherwise, um, you will just be rejected because like me, you might mis mistype or completely get wrong the name of the chambers in that answer. <laughs> now you have, it's a military operation. Unless you are, you know, um, taking your time and you don't particularly want to, spread the net wide. Um, if you're going to apply to a lot of sets of chambers to maximize your chances of getting pupillage somewhere, then you have it has to be a military operation. It has to be absolutely, you know, spreadsheeted. You have to know exactly who the chambers are and what they do and uh, exactly as you say, do all the research and then make the application and look like it's the only one you've ever done. I don't use <clears throat> spreadsheets. <laughs> You haven't got time to do spreadsheets. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, another question uh, online. Um, how would you, a, a lot of people coming into the legal profession are obviously a lot older than uh, they would be traditionally. <coughs> how would you deal with those challenges when applying for jobs? Is it the challenge of being older? Yeah, an, oh. an older applicant as opposed to a younger applicant. I think focus on the experience that you bring to the table. Yeah. You know, everybody has something that they've done that's interesting, I guarantee it. I, I, I fail to believe that there isn't something interesting that every single person in this room and listening online has done. Tell us about it. That's what I want to know. I don't necessarily care if I'm recruiting someone, I care about what kind of person they are. So I've got to work with them every day. You know, you can teach technical abilities, you can teach stuff that can be taught but what you can't change is who someone is if someone's got something really interesting about themselves please tell me go to your point earlier mm -hmm. um you know if you've got interesting or even not interesting everybody's got something transferable i think that's what we've all talked yeah. about tonight mm -hmm. everybody's got something transferable think about what those skills have been and tell us about them how does it apply to the work that my department does the job that you want how does your experience relate to that that's going to tell me whether or not you're someone I want to meet. I think Anthony's point earlier about resilience, I mean, that's a great point. Most people who've been in work have, uh, are out of the blocks much quicker because you know how to organise your time, you know how to uh, work for an employer, you know how to prioritise, you know, all of the things that people who come fresh out of school don't necessarily know how to do. And, you know, when you look at some of the pupils I mean, I now deal a bit with pupils, I'm not supervisor or anything, but I deal with mentoring some of our pupils and, you know, some of the questions they ask you, you think, oh, Christ, of course you don't know how to do that because you've never actually been to work before. I mean, you know, simple <laughs> as that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, definitely. I mean, the resilience thing, you know, particularly pupillage in any chambers is, is a lot of hard work and it's all new, it's new to you if you've, if you've never done it before. And that ability to... Um, to draw on the things that you've done in the past that are difficult, um, whether they're personal things, some people have talked about, or whether they're work things, they, 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 that's, you know, you're out of the blocks and away. The other advantage, which, I mean, you can't sell this particularly to, to somebody, but, um, you know, I certainly find, um, and I don't know if my colleagues do as well, that um, because my face looks like it knows what it's doing, <laughs> even if I actually don't, you get better work than people who've been in the job for the same amount of time. Because, <laughs> well, I have to laugh because that's exactly what happens to me. Uh, exactly, I, my mom does. I mean, and even judges. I mean, I'm older than some of the judges that I sit in front of, and they look at me and think, you know, what he's talking about, Mr. Fox, he's been doing this for a long time. <laughs> And that's the selling point, you know. I, I just want, I just want to sort of reiterate that as well. I mean, going to the police station, which um, I used to do a hell of a lot, um, and you know, if I go to the police station now, I'm dealing with it's, it's natural. I'm dealing with younger officers, and they they are young. Yeah, they, they are young, right? And you do you are treated a bit differently because of your maturity. You are. You know, you could just even custody sergeants who used to, they used to be 
difficult to say the least. When first 20 odd years ago, when I first started, started going, and you know, you had old school custody sergeants who were near it, near the end of retirement, you know, and they've been in the, in the force for 30 odd years, and the way they used to sort of treat you, you know, even old, old DCs, and you'd be sitting outside for ages, it, it's not. You, you do get a bit of respect because of your because of your perceived um, experience, shall we say, Christian? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Experience. experience. So there is a lot to that. Yeah. Uh, gentleman in the blue, you had a question? Has it been answered? You had your hand up earlier. Oh, yeah. No, it was uh, about the CVs. I was going to follow on from that. Um, but I can ask a question if you want. That's <laughs> 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 for you. Yeah. So for like, um, I guess that's sort of like mature people in this room. Well, first of all, thank you for your time and the organisers for putting this together. Um, when we're competing with these sort of classic Ox Oxbridge uh, candidates um, in the UK, um, what tips would you give to stand out um, when you're up against those sort of applications? from these sort of academic, privileged uh, university graduates. Yeah, go on. I mean, I've already... Yeah. 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 Just be unashamed, unashamedly you. That's the best advice I can give you because I applied for three years for pupillage and I didn't get anywhere. And it was only when I was, I was, I was like, you know what, if these people don't want me, Fine, I won't do it. And I kind of I made my application with with not so much. Oh, I am Kate Rickstein. I really want to be a barrister. But I was just like, this is me. You take it or you leave it. And that is the that is the only time I ended up being offered pupillage. So just be unashamedly you. Be funny. Be be serious. Be whatever you are. Don't pretend to be something that you're not. And go and play in somebody else's sandpit. I mean, I, I, there are too many people. I mean, you can see when you look at a set of chambers, just look back over the pupils they've had over the last decade. And if they've all been to Oxford and Cambridge, then go and play somewhere else. I mean, there are plenty of sets of chambers that don't have that. I mean, yes, all of the really high prestigious London sets have a history of, I don't know if they will tell you now they don't do it anymore. They have a history of only employment, you know. It's a mere coincidence that the last 10 sets of pupils we've had, all been to Oxford or Cambridge, you got first, so, and then went to Harvard and did the Masters. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would reiterate all of that, um, but I would also relate back to what I said earlier. We're interested in who you are as a person. Own everything. Don't pretend to be something you're not, because A, you're not going to be happy. But also, if, if the place where you're applying to is going to prioritise that of what you bring to the table, is that really somewhere you want to build a career? It's got to be the right fit for you too. It's a two-way street. It's your own personality. Definitely. Yeah, sure. And yeah. that will actually shine through much more than you think. And yeah. I mean, the good news is that things are changing all the time. And eventually, the people who are, you know, people unfortunately, tend to pick people like themselves. So if the pupillage committees are all people who went to Oxford and Cambridge, guess what happens next? <laughs> if, if the pupillage committees are people from all sorts of backgrounds and all sorts of ages who've done all sorts of things in the past and you know, have, have had privilege or no privilege and went to a good university or bad one, didn't go to one at all, whatever, um, that, then you start to get people choosing a whole range of other people instead. And so it, it, it is changing, whether that's helpful to people in this room or not is a, is a different matter. But look around, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to under, undersell the benefits of going outside of London. And again, I don't want to, you know, dump on my own doorstep as I'm a guest of Garden Court and they're in central London. But <laughs> the advantages of going outside of London is that you don't get as many applications. I mean, working in where I do, I mean, our set is in Canterbury. I don't live in Canterbury. I actually live nearer London than I do Canterbury. But um, the pay is still good. The work is still great. You probably get opportunity to do more work that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily do in London. It tends to take to get far more <laughs> that local work coming to you. And um, we're, not, we're not as picky in that we, we don't get 100 Oxbridge candidates. We only get 40 and most of those look like idiots so we don't bother, you know. <laughs> so, what, what, you know, the, the range is that we're looking for different things. We're looking for people with a local connection. We're looking for people who um, are going to um, join a set of chambers that, that, that is bringing work in from 
within the southeast region in our case. And those are different priorities. We're not necessarily looking for the person who's going to be the next genius to write the book on contract law. No. How do you decide what area of law to study in? Uh, well, well, to specialise in? I knew it in my gut. Mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't. I, you see, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit more shallow than you. I, I, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't. So, I mean, I, I, I applied for people at criminal sets as well as civil sets, and um, the set I'm at um, is a mixed family and civil set. So, I did some family in my pupillage. I haven't really recovered from that. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, uh, you know, have a go at it all, really. I mean, uh, Again, my advice, certainly my advice would be get pupillage and then you can decide if you don't like what you're doing, do something else afterwards. I'm just very pragmatic about this. If you're, um, you know, I sort of went to the school of beggars can't be choosers. And if, you, if, you're, if you're coming in knowing that it's not easy for people who are um, converting from another career and are more mature and so on, if you know it's not easy because of the background you come from or the schools you went to or whatever it is, just get pupillage anywhere, it doesn't matter where, and then see what there is to do and decide what you'd like to do and move on from there. That would be my advice. Ask questions as well. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly from my well. experience, a lot of people fall into the area of law that they end up in. Um, I, like Victoria, I started out as a legal secretary doing family and employment law, and I thought I loved it. Um, ended up moving to a law firm and did a bit of crime and absolutely hated it. I was like, oh, these clients are awful, the prison smell. It's... <laughs> and now I would never do anything else. So just because you have your idea on a certain area of law, just be open-minded because it might not be the area that you end up doing. Can I just suggest also they'll keep your passion like if the passion is a particular area of law, you will all right as soon as we this this question came up, you will all have known whether that question relates to you or not. Because if it doesn't relate to you, you already have a passion. And if you do have that passion, then you have to let it shine and you have to let the the applicant the reader of the application know that. Um, but if you are somebody who is willing to try out different areas. If you can do a couple of mini pupillages, go to a county court and watch a civil case in action, or go to a crown court and watch a crown court trial in action. And and you know you don't have to go there every single day for two weeks, but explore your options, and you will start getting a feel. And once you get get a gut feeling, stick with it. If I may, I know I'm not a barrister, but I think it's still relevant. It actually. You know, we're talking about career shifting here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're not really sure what you want to do, actually, maybe try a few things out that aren't legal based. Mm -hmm. You know, that you you did some prison work. Uh, you you worked in a council, and these things all fed into, you know, what you decided you want to practice as law. There's there's a real strength in that. Mm -hmm. and then you make an informed decision as well when you get there. I think that sort of answers um, the next question online. Um, uh, the person comments that you've all mentioned the hard work that it took me to become legal practitioners. Um, the question is, why was it worth it? And why should a potential converter uh, consider trying to qualify? I'll take that first, if you don't mind. Um, the, <clears throat> the transformation of how I feel in myself has been worth every single sacrifice, every penny, every hour, every not seeing my husband, not having kids, to be honest, all of it was worth it because I am me. I wasn't me before. I've actually been able to, this process, exploring what it was I needed to do. And I, I imagine most people have a similar feeling. There's something else inside you that you need to explore do it follow that thread because it will make you who you are and make you happy that makes the sacrifices worth it and the hard work worth it can i add in on that i will tell you honestly i'm currently representing an 18 year old boy who is alleged to have committed a crime at the age of 17. um he his dad was murdered in jamaica when he was <coughs> nine his older brother died in 2021 in unexpected circumstances uh, and his mother was diagnosed with cancer and died within six months in December 2022. 
Um, all this boy really has left is me and my solicitor. Um, and when that question came through, firstly, I nearly started crying, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but secondly, that's what makes it worth it. When you can actually, when you, you're sometimes the only thing these people are left with. And all of the sacrifices, all of the late nights, all of the disclosure arguments and all of these arguments with prosecutors and, and robing, rooming, being robing, roomed and all of that is worth it when you are able to help somebody to me anyway that needs it um, and that doesn't have anyone else that will help. Um, that's, to me, that's what makes it worth it. Uh, any other questions from? Yes. Thank you. It doesn't come up as um, um, trivial after that last um, response there. Sorry. Um, in terms of thinking about how you present yourself, and I'm going to stick with people's applications, but I'm sure more broadly, how should you present your, if applicable, uh, present your reasons for leaving your former career? Because obviously, I think for most of for lots of us, there may be both push factors and pull factors. So pull factors towards the year, and then maybe things that you know led you to want to leave your other previous career for other reasons as well. And in terms of how honest and how blunt, I guess, mm -hmm. um, would you recommend being when discussing that? I would read the room on that. Mm -hmm. um, I probably wouldn't put it in writing on a CV. I'd probably use it as a conversation in an interview. Um, I don't know how the computer system works, so apologies if that's not quite an accurate response, but um, be, look, be, be sensible, read the room. Nobody wants to hear an interviewee bad-mouthing oh, no, no, no. or anything like that, so obviously be careful. Um, but at the same time, a career shift is a pretty big deal, and I don't, I don't think most people would really question too much any of the push factors. If you've got good reasons for the pull, I'd probably just focus on the positive reasons, personally. Um, but read the room. You know, if you feel that it's a safe place in which you can speak freely, then by all means, but but use your judgment. Um, just on more of a sort of practical level with working and studying and then future applications, how did you find having enough time to do, say, pupillage or vacation schemes or work experience? Obviously, we're here at the moment because it's the evening and we've come after work. But one thing that I've noticed as an issue is just the lack of actual holiday time because you've got to put some aside for your exams, put some aside for maybe a pupillage, maybe a vacation scheme. A holiday would be great. You know, just did you find that that hindered you, that you just didn't have enough time because of the work to do work experience or anything like that? Yeah. Or is like life experience enough? <laughs> I didn't know many pupillages at all because I had no time to. And I had to decide. The limit, I was working full time and I was obviously a parent as well and studying in ver you know, the various forms of study. And for me, I had to prioritise what were my priorities. Did I want to get a 2 1 so that I could go to bar school? And did I want to pass the bar exams or did I want to go and do all this other stuff? And so I just I had to really prioritise and pick. And so I, di I, did, I didn't do any mini pupils at all. I did some marshalling for a judge. Um, I didn't do anything that was, you know, the sort of thing that people put on their CVs, because guess what, I've already got a CV. I don't really need to go and do a bit of work experience at a law centre. You know, I was working for a property management company dealing with legal matters there. That was my job. So you, you've got to you've got to really focus in. And, and I mean, one of the things I would say, which kind of ties into this, is that the greatest, in my view, the greatest skill you can have if you're a mature person looking for a career change, probably just in life generally. Is an ability to place yourself in the landscape you're moving into and know where you sit. So if you could look at the legal profession, if you can look when you turn up to court at your opponent and what's going on around you and say to yourself, realistically, where, where do I sit in relation to these people and to this profession? Am I that guy up there? Am I that idiot over there? Where am I in relation to everybody else? And, and be reasonably right about that without, you know, being the X fan. We all know the sort of X factor syndrome where somebody goes, yeah, well, I'm a great singer and everybody says I'm a great singer and they're horrendous. That's the exact opposite of what I'm talking about. It's that realistic ability to place yourself. And that, that 
allows you to do some of those things, like decide what it is you actually really need to do and what it is that's really going to help your CV, rather than just doing what everybody else is doing. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's part of the skill that you're going to learn. When you come out of it, you will have organisational skills. Like, they're going to be amazing. You're going to have the best organisational skills of anyone applying for that job. And you're going to have more determination as a result as well. So to, to use that as part of the skill, the prioritisation is mass, massively important. A couple of things, just one thing on that point as well. Like if anyone's interested in crime, you can go to courts and just sit and watch. Um, you know, you can do that on a day off. There's loads of other things you can do rather than sitting in an office because, quite frankly, you're just going to be given photocopying to do and you're not practic you're not really going to learn much. So find other ways of sort of learning about the area of law that you want to go into and getting different experiences. Think outside the box. Um, before we um, move on to Mr. Robinson, um, there has been some calls. If anyone is interested, if any of the panel members um, are um, available as mentors, um, uh, there's a, a lot of interest on. I'm sure, everybody else here is available as a mentor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I always say, like, I, I say to anyone, if you want, if you want any um advice or cv looked over yeah i'm always available if i might not be responding in within 24 hours but within a week i, I will respond and if i don't harass me um, <laughs> but linkedin emails whatever i'm oh, yeah, just gonna say yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's all try and get each other's names add each other on linkedin let's start our own little network and um help each other you had a question just saw a hand. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm a single parent uh, and I had a few years extra after my second child because my her first has learning difficulties um, and I really, really want to get to the bar. But um, in that time, I single handedly got him his EHCP. Um, and I just wonder how you want your potential employees to talk about being a parent, that time out from your career, which I really fret about, <laughs> and to what extent I can put that lived experience on to a CV or bring it into an interview without it sounding like an overshare. Or, or, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. I mean, it, my view is, and I, as somebody who now sifts pupillage um, applications, um, being a parent of any description, and particularly being a single parent, is something that we we are um, alive to and will and we'll certainly accommodate. I mean, that's you should not view that as a barrier at all, first of all. Um, and anything that you've done that has demonstrated an ability to take on a problem and resolve it for yourself in that way is something that you should certainly be talking about. I, mean, I would say, yeah, you might not want to go into new details in particular, but it's, an, it's a clear example. I mean, we've had applicants before who've um, defended themselves in, in all sorts of weird and wonderful things. And, and, you know, sometimes, yeah, it looks a bit weird, but most of the time it's people who are, you know, genuinely trying to Resolve situations themselves and issues themselves. Can I just ask a question there, please? <clears throat> you, you were speaking about applicants defending themselves. I had a life experience myself of losing the roof over my head some years ago. And I actually had to, I was taken to court due to a debt and I was going to lose the roof over my head, my own home. Mm. I had to defend myself and stand up in, in front of the sheriff because I live in Scotland mm. and actually say to him, you know, I can pay this debt off. I had to convince him because the, the lawyer who was representing the housing association I was living with, um, you know, she was hell bent on actually me losing the roof over my head. And that didn't get to happen. I, I convinced the sheriff, you know, I took a deep breath and had the guts to say, well, look, I can do this, you know, I can pay this and I have the means and ability to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's an experience that you can bring, and I and I hope that's a, a minimal experience even that I could possibly bring. Certainly useful, I, and I certainly wouldn't apologise for taking a career gap with our children. I mean, that's um, that is um, as far as I'm concerned, that's that, that is not an issue. That you know, that means nothing. It, in fact, any you know, these days, any gap. I mean, there was a time you know, my, when my grandfather was a boy. If you changed jobs in your, in your life, there was probably something wrong with you. Um, everybody has career gaps now, um, and everybody moves jobs and moves careers. It's it's part, 
thankfully part of modern life and um, having a career gap because of her children is um, neither here nor there, I would say, in terms of... of oh, can I ask, is there a difference? If you're coming at it to go into the bar, <laughs> bringing straight out of uni, and having had a career break, what's the difference? Well, the likelihood is if you've had a career really, break, you've actually yeah. still had a career, which you haven't had if you come Precisely. straight out Precisely, you're of still bringing more to the table. Can I also yeah. like your skills? Yeah. And, and yeah. mum is a skill. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you want to come to the yeah. organised, bring those buzzwords in to your applicants. But employers do tend to focus on the gaps, but, yeah. but that's there are skills that, you know, a mum is a big skill. In that gap, you may not have been a mum, you may have been doing something else, looking after somebody else or whatever. Highlight those skills. You know, m most of our, or a large majority of our criminal cl clients have some form of learning disability or mental health illness. So, and the other part, act like kids anyway. Um, so, so those, that, is, that is one of the best skills you can have, is, is being a mum. That's exactly what I want to do. Okay, um, well, um, thank you everyone for contributing. That's the end of the Q&A session. Uh, and without further ado, um, I introduce Mr. Mark Robinson, Barrister at Garden Court Chambers. Uh, the organiser of this event, who has gained a reputation as a maverick who fiercely defends clients in, course, in court sorry, and rises to the challenge when dealing with complex legal issues and incorporating novel points of law into his decision. I've had the pleasure of instructing Mark on many occasions. It's all, it's all true, it's all true. Uh, sometimes I think, oh, not again. Um, so prior to the coming to the bar, Mark established a, a busy practice as a freelance solicitor with a leading East London criminal defence firm. Uh, he was a presenter on BBC Radio One Extra uh, and a professional DJ for many years. Uh, Mark also runs uh, uh, Lawyers at Large, which is a project uh, that he uh, uh, has embarked on with a, a school uh, to help kids get into uh, law, uh, and especially in a non-traditional way, which is what this is all about. So uh, please uh, give a warm welcome, everyone, for Mr. Mark Robin. Oh, good. Well, I suppose many of you are wondering, both here and online, why you've really not heard much from me. I think I do far too much talking anyway. With a wonderful panel like this, they do the talking, so I, I simply don't have to. So. I'd like to thank each and every one of them for giving up their time for my first ever event. And there was a lot of riding on this uh, event. I've, um, I've been at Garden Court, what, 11 months now, 10, 11 months. And I convinced them to allow me to put this event on for you guys. And if this would have not gone too well, maybe I have not been in Garden Court tomorrow morning. But <laughs> it went well, and I'm pleased to say that my tenancy will continue. But I'd like to thank each and every one of these um, wonderful um, lawyers in turn. So firstly, put a hand together for Victoria. <laughs> put your hand together for Christian. Hand together for Kate. Hand together for Anthony. Hand together for Alex. Can't forget our wonderful sponsors in the room. So, um, hand together for Bert Beck, who sponsored this event. <laughs> And for the University of Law, who's the sponsor of the event? <laughs> Don't let your hands on, I. We've got Black Solicitors Network as well. <laughs> Last but not least, my wonderful chambers, and all welcome to my wonderful home garden court. Um, we're out around for garden court. <laughs> Two more, then I'm, I'm, I'm done. A new show who's been sitting at the front there from Garden Court. 
is the system tonight to make sure the tech runs fine. And last but not least, I promise you, the wonderful Natasha, who is your host. <laughs> I'm so glad you guys got um, so much from this event. Um, again, I came to the profession very late, and the reason I decided to put this on is I, when I was starting out, all these um, kind of networking events, everything was just geared towards young people. You know, I'm, I didn't start in the profession until I was 40 years old, and that was about eight years ago. I'm 48, soon to turn 49. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> anyway, um, you know, I came to the profession very late and I thought to myself, everything skewed towards young people with absolutely no life experience. Now, I've been on both sides of the track, I've been a solicitor and a barrister, and one thing I can tell you all is that life experience truly is valued. You know, there's these 20 something kids that have not had any kind of um, experience in life, let alone in the workplace. And they come and and they get given these opportunities by these law firms and then train. But it's when you're dealing with real people, especially in the kind of work that I do, life experience means so much. Again, um, I was able at I started at the bar exactly three years this month and at 45 years old. And I was probably, according to my last chambers, I was in one of the people that built um, the most quickest um, Crown Court practice after three months I was doing Crown Court trials. And generally that's kind of unheard of. But the reason I did it, and according to um, feedback in Garden Court as well, is because I'm let's just say more mature. So when clients deal with me, they perceive me as life experience. And to be honest, if you've not looked at my CV online, you naturally assume I've been practicing at the bar for many years and I give that impression. And of course, when things go right, you get, you know, it's got that life experience. When things go wrong, which is very rare, it's only been called a few minutes. So it's a double-edged sword, but it's important to have these kind of events. And I'm, I just want to share with you guys that Look, it's never, ever too late. Whether you're 40, whether you're 50, 60, you can still have a really re rewarding career. And the last story I'll tell you, I did a trial last week at Snaresbrook Crown Court. It was um, a serious sexual offence, but it's not about the case I did. It was about my prosecutor. Um, I'm going to big her up. Her name is Patricia May, and she was wonderful. This lady was called to the bar in 1965. She's nearly 80 years old. She still continues to work. We had such a wonderful time. It was one of the nicest trials I've ever done in the profession. She was so nice to me and she was so, ex the, the experience she brought to the table, she was still on point. She was still sharp as a raised with her legal submissions. And, and she gave me a bloody good run for, for my money as well. And she, she said to me, look, you know, if I didn't carry on doing this, what else would I do, Mark? You know, my husband's retired at home. My daughter's a doctor, but I come. I still take public transport. You know, there was no um, air of any frailty around this woman. And she inspired me because, you know, she, she was born in, in World, War II, World War II and she still comes to work at the criminal bar. And if she can do it, if she can still practice, being in mind, called in 1965, like, my, my, my parents hadn't even, boy, well, you know, you know, you know, you know, no, I'd say it's, it's in my grandparents, you know, you know what I'm saying, no, on, on, on the real, she can still practice uh, at that age, then there's no excuse for not coming to the bar late, you know, there is, what, with what we do, there's no retirement date, it's not like judicial positions where you have to retire at 70, you can go on, and uh, she's inspired me so much because, you know, hopefully, as long as I've still got my faculties in 35 years' time, I still would love to be able to do this job. So, look, guys, enough from me. I want you to network, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, and ask as many questions of us. Uh, 
as you will, you know, no question is a stupid question. You know, you're, you're here to network. That's the purpose of you coming here in person. And again, um, make the most of it. You know, for me I'm, as well, if you don't get a chance to speak to me tonight, although I hope most of you will do, um, LinkedIn's a great place. Again, I'm always open to people shadowing me in court. You know, I always try to respond, um, you know, come along and see what it's all about at the criminal bar. Like, don't listen to Christian about <laughs> putting down us humble criminal barristers. You know, you're going to have a great time. You're going to see jury trials. You're going to see the judge chastise me and, you know, be really mean and horrible to me. And it's all part of the fun. But with that said, um, um, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you so much for coming.